Very good morning. Happy almost October. It's tomorrow. It's October. Exciting. I finally got all of my all of my Halloween lights outside set up. Um, went over the top this year. We, we put up this whole like tunnel for the kids to walk through, like on our sidewalk. It was kind of cool. So uh, I'm ready. I'm ready for October finally. Well, with our nice cool 95 to like 103 degree weather that we're gonna have this week, I'm so ready for cool weather. I need to move. I think I'm in the wrong part of the world, but uh, I'm ready for it anyway. I saw like a a TikTok and it was like somebody like doing the same thing. They, they were all excited for, for fall and it was like 90 and they're wearing their flannel and they're like carrying around their pumpkin spice latte, desperate for the fall in our warm, warm Southern California weather. Anyway, it's all right. Uh, more than anything, I'm just trying not to get sick. I feel like everybody around me is sick. Like all my kids are sick. I'm like, don't breathe on me, children. Uh, I was like, there's a, a lot going around here. We all stay healthy, not on something. Uh, we'll keep going with where we left off. I gave you a homework assignment that I want to give a couple of minutes to just kind of chat about with a few people around you, and then we'll talk about it together, and then I'll collect it uh, kind of like we normally do. So if you want to find a couple of people around you and just kind of share what you came up with for those four stories, and then if you have time, you can share the one that you created. Um, but I'll give you a few minutes to kind of check in with a few people around you, then we'll talk about it together. So whatever's convenient, uh, go ahead and chat about it for a couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, if you had emailed me, I get it in class. So if you ever need to check the point of the class, you can send those to you or got numbers with so you can email me if that's something that you have to look at. So it's just not to be too cute and possibly or to do your body. So I'll give you a couple more minutes and I'll chat about it to get and then Is there anybody interested in other team? I know it's like it's like an app editor or whatever. You could definitely send it to me. Yeah. I'll figure that out. I have to figure out to see what you're going to do. So you can send it to me. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
All right, are you ready? What do you think? Have you thought about it together? No, of course it. Uh, again, these are real stories, right? I shortened it because they were quite long. Uh, but these are real things that were came out of the news. These do pop up every now and then. They're not the most common, but they're definitely things that happen. What do we think for Brian? Anyone want to share your thoughts for what you think is going on with Brian? Brian, who uh, had some issues come up. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Very delight. What do we think? Brave soul on an early Monday morning, Brian. Wait. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you know the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And the fact that, like, think about it, I just think the name helps, right? Like, you convert an emotional trauma to a physical issue, right? So, if you remember what that name, and that's definitely what happens with him here, he loses that sensation, right? But it's nothing that happened physically, it's something that happened emotionally. And once he comes to grips with that, it should come back from this kind of the essence of that disorder. So think about that again as so it's kind of like hysteria. It's that very dramatic thing. So that's perfect. Really nice job on Brian. How about Blanca? Do you want to take Blanca since you had volunteered to kind of for Brian? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that one is too much presence, but mm -hmm. um, because she was delivering the king of the slave, the first time that may have actually been slave, and then she really sent the attention to that. Little. Yeah. So her daughter kept getting sick every time she visited her. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, for sure. I think that fits really well. And remember, like, we can call it um, Munchausen by proxy. You could also call it factitious disorder. I think this makes more sense with, with her case. But that's perfect, right? She's doing it on, perfect, on purpose, uh, making her sick for attention. Uh, really sad that happens a lot with, like, a parent and a child with the by proxy piece of this. So remember, by proxy is with another person versus Munchausen would be with yourself. Um, how about Tom? Anyone want to share your thoughts on Tom or... Chicago lawyer. I know it's early. You got that. I'm going to collect them in a minute. What do you think, Tom? Huh? Okay. Don't make me pick somebody. I feel so mean just picking you randomly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that fits in well. Thank you, right? So for Tom, right, uh, he doesn't have sometimes, like, so he's preoccupied with all of his physical stuff, which is very typical of this. Again, think of like a hypochondriac, someone who's always uh, kind of blowing everything out of proportion. The one sometimes people will think is somatic symptom disorder, but he doesn't have all of those different things. Remember, you had to have a, a sexual symptom and a neurological symptom, which he's missing. So I definitely think that that illness anxiety disorder fits him really well uh one last one right leslie i want to call her kim and this could be kim we could just cross it off and put kim on there uh, but thoughts on on leslie one last one anybody I gotta stop staring at that light like it's literally blinding me <laughs> leslie kim the hint is in the name right oh yeah oh yeah somebody you want to do it? Uh, I don't know. I think that's what I worked Okay. I think that's what I after class, I think. I handed him out three weeks. Oh, you left early. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Kim, Leslie, right? Munchausen factitious disorder. Right. I would put it here as well. Again, that faking. I told you like last time that we threw a Kim a baby shower and everything for her twins that she never had. Kind of a similar thread here. Uh, you know, where she's purposefully doing something to get attention. And again, those terms kind of interchangeable, but Munchausen would kind of be the common, common name. Um, and then I look forward to the one that you created. Uh, I look forward to reading those. So if you want to pass those up, I'll come collect them from you and then we'll 
we'll um, we'll move on here. Do I have everyone? Okay. Uh, so a few causes and treatments, and then we'll move on uh, from there. There's a couple of other things in this chapter that are kind of smaller, more common uh, issues that people face. But uh, as we were talking about last time, I moved things out of order because I think that this makes a really like logical transition from the stress and trauma chapter. These are very stress and trauma related, just like the things that we talked about in chapter five. So when people have something horrible happen to them, as was the case for a few of these individuals, sometimes we convert it to a physical symptom. And what we talked about, um, if you remember Besser, Bessel van der Kolk from the last chapter, he talked about how trauma lives in the body. So it's very common when we experience something traumatic for it to have like a physical effect on us and maybe even a long-term physical effect. So we also can have some behavioral and cognitive explanations. Behaviorally, things like Munchausen's are rewarding, right? When you want sympathy and attention and you fake illness and people give you sympathy and attention, it's rewarding, that's positive reinforcement, right? So you might be more likely to do it again and again and again, uh, or the cognitive explanations of like, this is the only way I know how to get attention, right? And sometimes people get into a trap of not knowing how to get attention or sympathy or care in a positive way, they'll settle for any way that they can. Really common with children, but it can persist into adulthood as well. The treatment for these, where right, people don't tend to go to therapy, right? If you woke up and you were blind, you wouldn't go to a therapist, you'd go to a doctor, right? If you lost sensation in your hand, you'd go to a doctor. And so oftentimes what happens is we only like figure this out when it doesn't present the way that it should. Right. So, for example, like in the clip I showed you where he goes blind, they check everything with his eyes. His eyes are fine. Right. And typically when you, everything checks up physically, then we start to look at other explanations. So it might be that it takes a while to figure out that it's a mental illness instead of a physical one. People seek multiple opinions typically because they don't present very clearly. And oftentimes the idea is to find the root. Right, so if somebody has something where it's attention seeking, then we try and figure out a better way to get attention. If it's driven by depression, maybe we do some medication for depression or anxiety. But a lot of it is finding the root of the disorder, the root of that drive, and then trying to address it in a healthier way, ideally, rather than uh, something like faking or converting or whatnot. So again, that aren't the most common disorders, but they definitely happen typically very strong uh, trauma. That's stress and trauma together, trauma and stress related. What are more common are psychophysiological or psychosomatic disorders. These are incredibly common. And I imagine a lot of you have maybe struggled with one of the things up here, right? At things like insomnia, having a difficult time sleeping, headaches, right? Asthma, ulcers, heart disease, high blood pressure. All of these things can be an interaction of psychological and organic or biological factors. So a lot of people struggle with headaches, which might be somewhat driven by stress, right? Stress can cause us to have headaches. When we're stressed out or we're struggling with things psychologically, maybe we don't sleep. Rates of insomnia went through the roof during COVID. A lot of people not sleeping because of the anxiety and stress that they felt. Um, and again, all of these things, all the way from high blood pressure to heart disease, to muscle headaches, asthma, ulcers, all of them can be very, very driven by some interaction between a biological factor and a psychological factor. And as I mentioned, these are notoriously common. And it's really like often the case when people have things like migraines, let's look at some of the factors in your life that might be contributing to them rather than just something physical, right? It's also really, really common that when people are stressed out, they get sick, really common to get sick when you're stressed. During finals week or just after finals week, like everybody is coughing and sniffling because you're stressed out and that takes a toll on your system. When all of that energy that you have is going to stress, it leaves your immune system vulnerable. It creates this like competing need for energy within your system and we're more likely to get sick. 
And there's a whole branch of psychology that studies this. It's called psychoneuroimmunology, or PNI for short. And it looks at the relationship between the immune system and stress and illness. And we know that like this can be a very common thing to try and tackle. Like if someone has cancer or like a big systemic issue, we need to keep their stress levels under control because it impairs the immune system. So just a really like strong correlation between how our immune system functions as it connects to things like stress and trauma and so on. Lots of things we can do to help with that kind of stuff. There's a whole branch called uh, behavioral medicine that looks at interventions to help with like stress and medical issues. And this is something that's growing um, in popularity quite a bit. And there's a ton of like apps that are related to this. I don't know if any of you have ever used Calm, but I love this app, right? It's a really cool app that has all these great like soundscapes and stories and sleep stories and things like that meditations and uh, things along those lines. But all of these things can be little um, ideas that help with managing stress when people are starting to have physical issues from it. So learning how to relax, very common to do something called like a calm place exercise. It's a meditation or a mindfulness exercise. A lot of people will do to kind of put themselves in a peaceful, relaxing place that maybe is recharging or energizing for them in some way, or just peaceful for a few minutes. Biofeedback is another one. They put little instruments on your body to, to measure how much muscle tension you have. Really interesting to, to do this. I did it once as part of like a graduate study um, like item that we had. And you all hold tension in your body, but when you're stressed, you tend to have a lot more tension. You ever catch yourself driving? Like I, I do this all the time. I'll be driving and I'm like squeezing the steering wheel way too tight. And I'll be like, okay, relax, let it go. Right. Or I'm clenching my jaw or I, like my muscles are tight. We tend to do that a lot when we're stressed and things like biofeedback. We'll look at where are we holding that tension so we can try and focus on letting it go. Meditation, hypnosis, even um, you can obviously do therapy. Mindfulness is a huge one that's gaining so much popularity right now. It's been around for a long time, but doing things like being in the present moment um, is a really big one. Self care, right? Caring for yourself and doing little things to make yourself like calm and relaxed. All of these things can help with battling stress, especially when it's starting to cause some physical issues for you. And I have a really, um, I don't know if I want to say it's amazing, but I like it. Um, I found this little like forest walk meditation. It's about eight or nine minutes. Anyone interested in doing it? I just need like one nod and we'll go, right? No, I got a nod. Okay, we're good. All right. So I found this meditation and I think some people struggle with these kind of things because they make us sleepy sometimes. Hopefully that does make you sleepy. It's tempting at 8.50 in the morning. Uh, but I want to play this for you and do the best you can to get comfortable, uh, which I know is challenging in these chairs in a classroom filled with people you don't know very well. But do your best, right? So it's going to ask you to close your eyes if you're comfortable. And you're going to just kind of do this little calm place uh, visualization, if you will. So let me pause this and then um, I will play it for you. And that can happen with these, right? But those are really nice things to do though. So that one was like nine minutes. And obviously you don't have to do anything that lengthy, but just something even what we sometimes call a mindful moment, right? Just closing your eyes and taking a few deep breaths, connecting to the present, doing a meditation like that. Sometimes those things can really help us to just kind of reset a little bit. And they take some practice. Like how many of you at some point during that started thinking about something else, right? I did. I was thinking about like, oh, don't forget to set your fantasy roster for tonight. I was thinking about football. Then I thought about dinner. I just kept telling myself, come back, come back, come back. Right. And it takes practice, but you get better the more that you do them. Uh, but there's a bunch of those you can find, obviously, free online. The apps like Calm and so on are really great for them as well. Uh, but little things like that can be really helpful when you have a lot of stress. Um, and I also I sent this out, but I want to just uh, remind you really quickly here. Let me close this. Um, so if you go onto Canvas, see if I have internet. Um, for some reason, it's like the internet and like the cell service is like completely dead. I don't know. Does anyone else just say SOS? Or is it just me, right? I don't, I don't know. It's not working. Uh, but if you go onto our website, our Canvas site, 
I sent out an announcement last time um, or sometime over the weekend, I believe it went out, um, related to an extra credit opportunity. So I know a few of you like missed the assignment um, that was due today because you either weren't here or whatnot, whatever um, happened. And so if that happens, um, you know, this might be something that's helpful for you. But I sent this out. It's an extra credit opportunity um, that I'd like to extend to you. Um, and so it has to do with the idea of self-care and mindfulness. And this is a really like huge buzz thing in psychology right now, self-care. Mindfulness has been for years. But if you're interested, this is worth five points and you can do it anytime between now and the end of the semester. Okay, so you have the whole rest of the class to do this. But what you're going to do is read this little article right here. Um, about self-care. It's pretty short, but it describes like what it is, different types, some examples and so on. And then you can take pictures of you engaging in five different self-care activities. And self-care is really legitimately whatever you make it, right? Like my favorite self-care activity is to eat a piece of chocolate cake. Makes me feel better. Self-cake instead of self-care, right? I think that works. It can be anything that you want. It can be taking a nice shower. It can be going on a walk. It can be going to get a massage. It can be elaborate. It can be small. Um, and that's kind of described in this article right here. But what you'll do is you'll take a picture of five different self-care activities. You don't have to be in it. Ideally, you're actually not in it. But just some element of the activity. Try and have your images be like well composed, right? Take some time. The picture um, is kind of like the fun part of what you're turning in. And then there'll be a little description of what you did. And you can upload that here um, anytime or upload it on the self-care extra credit link that's right here. Um, at any point between now and the end of the semester, and it's worth five points. So I'll just kind of grade them as they come in. Uh, but if you're interested in doing this, please take advantage. One, I'm uh, encouraging you to care for yourself, and two, I'm giving you points for doing so. So um, hopefully you can find a way to, to do that, especially if you're feeling like the need for some self-care. It's a great opportunity to do it. Um, so that's under announcements, and then there's a link right here where you can turn that in anytime between now and when our class ends in December. Okay. I just wanted to share that with you before I forgot. Uh, any questions about this or any other thoughts related to chapter eight? Yeah. Is ASMR land in this slide? Sure. So, I mean, ASMR, right, with the like, that, like repetitive, like sound of some kind, right? I mean, in a sense, it's almost like a meditation or like a calm background. Like I put them on all the time in the background in our house. Like we have all these like ASMR, like landscapes that we'll put on just while we're doing work or while we're cleaning. Like they're, they're kind of relaxing. Like a lot of people enjoy having that background constant noise as a way to kind of be calm or relaxed. In a sense, it's almost a form of like meditation definitely falls. There's a lot of them on those apps um, that I mentioned, but it falls into this realm for sure, right? It can be very calming for people, that kind of repetitive background kind of uh, noise or image, if you will. Some fun ones for Halloween. We put them on all the time. Like we go with the, the holidays, <laughs> whatever holiday we have. Right? My Halloween. right, that's right. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments, questions, anything here or about the extra credit before we, we move on? Okay, so uh, our next chapter, kind of uh, shifting gears a little bit here, we go to mood disorders. So we'll start this today, and we'll definitely just kind of get started on it, and then we'll move into it more. Uh, next time, we have a guest speaker that's supposed to come in like a week or two um, to talk about suicidality and suicide prevention, which is definitely uh, you know something that tends to sadly be connected with the mood disorders. But we'll talk a little bit about depression, mania, bipolar disorder, um, a lot of treatments, especially some newer ones. We'll talk about those as well. Uh, so we'll get into this a little bit today. Let me move this up because it's in my way. I don't like it here. <laughs> All right. So uh, just like anything else that we've talked about, right, there's like variations in mood and then there's mood disorders. And we said that anxiety disorders were the most common. Mood disorders are number two, right? So anxiety, most common, mood, second common. How many of you know someone who struggles with depression or bipolar or mania just by a show of hands, yourself or someone in your life? Right? A lot of you, uh, these are really sadly quite common disorders. Uh, and when we talk about a mood disorder, we're looking at emotional extremes. So all of us are gonna have ups and downs, right? And you're reacting hopefully to things in your life. If things are really good, you're gonna be up. 
things are a little bit worse or like poor, like you might be down, but we tend to have a lot of like mood in the middle. So if you think about mood as existing on a spectrum, you'd have the high end of mood and the low end of mood. And everything in here would kind of be like what's normal or typical. And again, most of us kind of bounce back and forth between higher and lower, but kind of in that normal or typical range on a, any given day. The low end of mood, the extreme low end, we would call depression. And the extreme high end, we would call mania. But again, most of us in the middle, right? The vast majority of the time. So people can struggle with just depression. If we add mania, those two together, we call that bipolar disorder. Now it used to be called manic depression. Makes sense, right? Mania and depression, manic depression. But there's actually two different types of bipolar disorder, which we'll talk about um, at a later time. But there's bipolar one and bipolar two, uh, kind of depending on how severe your mania is. So when we talk about mood, you can be all the way down, all the way up. You can have both of them occurring together, which we call bipolar disorder. But again, as I said, most of us kind of in that normal, typical range. Depression, and we'll talk about these both more quite a bit, just to introduce the two ends. Depression is that extreme low sad state, right, where you have a lack of energy, low self-worth, guilt, things don't bring you pleasure. Mania, on the other hand, is that very frenzied up state where you're kind of grandiose, you believe that you can do anything, reckless, impulsive behavior is really common in a manic state. And again, we'll spend a lot more time kind of talking about each, but just to kind of give you a perspective of the opposite ends of mood. So we'll start with depression, which um, is the more common of the mood disorders. A lot of people struggling with some degree of depression. Um, but we'll talk about mania and add bipolar disorder uh, on Wednesday when we get there. So if we look at just the low side, the low side of mood, if people have only depression, and I don't mean to say that depression is not a lot, but in this case, like only depression, meaning no mania, no manic episodes ever, then we would say that they have unipolar or major depression. Major depressive disorder or MDD, sometimes called unipolar because it's just one pole. And mood is two poles, which is bipolar, but just one side would be depression. So if people have unipolar or major depressive disorder, it means that at some point they've had what's called a major depressive episode. So in order to have a diagnosis of unipolar major depression, you have to have a major depressive episode. And the reason that they do these separately, like an episode, is because we also talk about manic episodes, which we'll get to um, again on Wednesday. So let me erase this so we can look at some of the symptoms of depression. Okay. So when we look at a major depressive episode, major depressive episode. So in order to have an episode of depression, which will qualify you for the diagnosis of unipolar major depression, you have to have five symptoms or more. So five plus symptoms lasting for at least two weeks. So again, we have this duration piece, like every disorder, right? It has to be something that's going ongoing for at least two weeks. Some people have major depressive episodes that last for months. Other people, it might just be a matter of weeks. Okay? So we have this criteria of time as, which is a really important element. But some of the things that people might have, you can have weight loss or weight gain. Sometimes when people are depressed, they don't even care enough to eat. They have no motivation or drive to eat whatsoever and they lose weight. Other people, when they're depressed, eat everything, right? It's almost like they're eating to try and fill the hole that they feel or to make themselves feel better. So it can show up as losing weight or gaining weight. It can go in either, either direction. You have a diminished interest in pleasurable activities. So 
So things that used to bring you pleasure, you don't enjoy anymore. You've always loved playing your guitar. You don't even want to do it anymore. You used to like to hang out with your friends, just don't have the energy or drive to do it. You stop being interested in or taking pleasure in the things that you used to enjoy. That's a very common symptom of depression. It makes it hard for you to get pleasure because you're just not even interested, right? So you have less interest and less pleasure in the things that you used to enjoy. Um, you can have insomnia or hypersomnia. Insomnia is when you struggle to fall asleep or stay asleep. So you lay down at night, you have a really hard time going to bed, or you wake up all night long, you don't sleep well, don't sleep solidly. Hypersomnia is when people sleep all the time, like you won't get out of bed, right? So maybe you're sleeping way too much or all the time. So struggle, um, struggling to fall asleep or stay asleep, and then sleeping all the time. And again, it can go either way, just like with the weight loss or weight gain. People can show one pattern or the other. Um, you have fatigue. or loss of energy, you're exhausted. You feel wiped out and tired, even though maybe you've done nothing, right? You're absolutely exhausted and tired. You don't, you fatigue or tire very easily. That's a very, very common like symptom. Um, you have feelings of worthlessness or guilt. I'm worthless, I'll never amount to anything. You feel guilty for like struggling or not being able to do the things that you used to do. Uh, it can kind of manifest in either way. You don't think clearly, so you struggle to concentrate or think clearly. Sometimes people describe it as like a mental fog. It's like everything is fuzzy and you have a hard time thinking clearly. You might struggle to remember things or pay attention or concentrate. It's really, really common. People have thoughts of death or suicide. Very high correlation between depression and suicidality. And the number one reason people are suicidal is they feel hopeless. And oftentimes with depression, because you feel worthless and you feel this guilt, and you can't think clearly and you're like not finding pleasure in things, it can be really hard to see the big picture, especially when you're caught up in like an episode like this. Sometimes you also have something called psychomotor agitation. This is more common with mania where people have like a repetitive movement that they do, but it can sometimes come up here, right? Uh, maybe you like wring your hands constantly or you pull on like your hair in some way, or you put a sweater on and off constantly. It's some kind of like repetitive behavior that you do a little bit mindlessly. It tends to be much more manic in nature, like people like tapping or clicking. Like my daughter, when she's in like a mood, will like go like this, like stop it. Like she just clicks and clicks and clicks and clicks, right? And she doesn't even realize that she's doing it, though all of us around her are like, like twitching, right? It can be like that, but this tends to be a little slower in nature because it's related to depression. And I once heard somebody describe depression and it kind of stuck with me. I think it's a really good descriptor. They said that depression feels like the anguish of grief mixed with the sluggishness of jet lag, right? And I think that was a really good description, right? Like you're wiped out, exhausted, you're drained, you're tired and you're sad. And it may or may not have anything to do with life circumstances. It might be something that's purely chemical. But if, in order to have a depressive episode, you have to have five or more of these lasting for two weeks, which then means that you have unipolar or major depression. Any like stories or comments or thoughts? A lot of you raised your hand. Any um, like comments or thoughts about people in your life who struggle with depression? Anything at all? It can be very hard to find like motivation when you have this. It's a very like uh, draining and exhausting disorder to have, and a lot of it, or if not all of it, is happening like in your in your head, sadly. Then I have an example for you. It's notoriously unpopular, which makes me just want to play it even more. So. Uh, but I'll play you a clip um, of somebody that I think is a good example of depression. Um, just the whole character, very like depression, like her whole character really. 
is very depression like but that movie especially you see a lot of it but right? she's not eating right she's sitting there not eating she's not hanging out with other people or being social you see sleep disturbance right insomnia I feel bad for charlie more and more like the older i get i'm like poor charlie right like as the dad i feel bad for him right uh, but you see a lack of interest in activities that she enjoyed she's not sleeping she's not eating that whole book or movie, whatever, right? There's a lot of like suicidality and thoughts of death, right? Um, so you see a lot of that in her character, obnoxious character, but a good example nonetheless. Um, and so um, I think she's a good example of someone in a major depressive episode. And for her, it lasts quite a bit longer than two weeks. It just has to be two weeks, though for some people it can be, as I mentioned, months or even like longer, right? Sometimes people stay in a depressive episode for quite some time. Any other like thoughts, questions, comments, anything about depression? Again, stories, thoughts, comments, anything? There's one other one here, uh, persistent depressive disorder. So sometimes people have a very long-term low-grade depression. Um, and we call that persistent depressive disorder. It used to be called dysthymic disorder. Dysthymia is Greek for melancholy. Right. As somebody who's just always sad, right, like a low grade version of sad. And so for this disorder, somebody has to have these symptoms, but on a lower grade level for at least two years. So you have all of this stuff going on, but it's not as impacting as someone who's having a major depressive disorder. So in this sense, it's like a long-term low-grade depression. This one's hard to diagnose. It sometimes gets missed as like personality, that somebody's just kind of like low um, or like a little bit like sad or melancholic like a lot of the time. But it's a low-grade persistent depression that lasts for at least two years. But the big one, the one that most people struggle with, is a major depressive episode or like unipolar major depression. A lot of explanations for depression, but most of them are very biological in nature, right? And it's so interesting with depression. Uh, my partner's family is like a Catholic, Hispanic, really traditional. I go over really well with them, as you can imagine. Um, but we've been together a long time. I think they've gotten used to me. It's clear I'm not going anywhere at this point. Um, but in her family, it's very much this mentality of like, we'll just suck it up, right? Like, stop, just stop it. There was an old like um, Saturday Night Live thing that was like, well, just stop it. You're depressed. Come to this therapist and he'll tell you like the magical cure. Just stop it. Right. And if people could just stop it, depression wouldn't be a thing. And one of the reasons that people can't just stop being depressed is a lot of it is very biological. It could be somewhat environmental and depression can definitely be environmental. But for a lot of people, it has to do with like biochemical factors or things that are happening chemically in their brain. And that makes it really challenging to stop, just stop being depressed, right? If you can't control those chemical reactions. So there is a little bit of a genetic element to depression, something like 20 something percent. I wanna say it's 27% likelihood if one of your parents has it. So if you have a biological parent who has depression, you are more vulnerable to depression than the average person. Doesn't mean you're doomed to get it, but you're more vulnerable. And so there is a little bit of a genetic piece, but the big one is there are a lot of biochemical factors. Neurotransmitters such as serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine play a huge role in depression and therefore in the treatments for depression, which we'll talk about as well. So when people have too little norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, it's thought to correlate very strongly to depression. And a lot of the treatments, as I mentioned, focus on targeting norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine to increase their levels to make people feel better. So we see it over and over and over again that people who have depression have very low levels of those three neurotransmitters. We're also noticing, and this is something that's kind of newer, like this has come out within the last like 10 years and it's really revolutionizing like the way that we treat depression. We found a brain circuit for depression. A brain circuit is a network of structures in the brain that work together in some way to create like emotional reactions. 
And so what we found is there are a cluster of different um, like structures in the brain that when they're not working properly, are thought to cause depression. And we can target that when we're treating it, um, which we'll talk about as well. So the brain circuit for depression, let me erase this here, has a couple of different parts of it. So the brain circuit for depression has one area in it called Broadman Area 25. Two ends area 25. Super, super tiny little region of the brain that is incredibly rich in serotonin receptors, named after the person who discovered it, right? But it's incredibly rich in serotonin receptors, and it's thought to play a big role in mitigating depression. And so we've noticed this little area and we target it pretty heavily in some of the newer treatments like TMS and so on that we'll, that we'll talk about. So uh, Broadman area 25, it also includes the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an area of the brain in charge of memory. I always picture a hippo strutting down the campus, right? He's there to learn and remember. I don't know, whatever helps you remember things. That was my hippo strut, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but if it helps you remember, right? Uh, it's in charge of memory. Memory tends to really struggle. Again, you don't think clearly when you're depressed. Um, we also see that the amygdala is part of it. And the amygdala is a part of the brain that's in charge of emotions. Memory, serotonin. Right, so this part of the brain is very overactive and someone who's depressed. See a lot of activity of the amygdala, which causes more depression. And then finally, um, the prefrontal cortex. Which is in charge of things like decision-making and logical thought. It's very underactive, which is why people struggle to think clearly. So these four parts of the brain are all kind of working together in the perfect storm, in the perfect negative way to create depression. And some of the newer methods of treatment have the idea of like, well, maybe we can target these parts of the brain through like pulsed radiation or pulsed like um, magnetic pulses. And what that can do is make them a little more active to thereby reduce depression. So again, something that has come up in the last 10 years and so we still have our antidepressants that we use and we use pretty heavily, but these brain circuits are starting to gain a lot of traction and we're using them quite a bit in our, our newest treatment modalities. So uh, as I mentioned, the old standby and the thing that we use the most of anything are antidepressant medications. Antidepressants as a group are medications that fight depression, right? Hence the name antidepressant, they fight depression unipolar depression and then dysthymia. So just that one side of the mood spectrum. And these antidepressants fall into four main groups. Now there are obviously atypical ones, but these are the main groups that they fall into. MAOIs, tricyclics, SSRIs, and SNRIs. And these four different groups each contain like quite a few different types of substances that all work in their own like slightly different way. They have their own side effect profiles and so on, but all of the medications that we have for fighting depression, they pretty much fall into one of these four categories. And I have a little like video, it's not the most thrilling, but I think it's helpful for understanding these. So I'll play it for you and then we'll come back to this um, slide and talk about it a little more. But it kind of goes of these four categories and let's talk about them a little bit uh, more. Uh, so, four different groups, and I have them up there and up here from oldest to newest, right? So the MAOIs and the tricyclics or tricyclics, I've heard it both ways, are older groups of medication that are not used hardly at all anymore, right? You almost never would be prescribed a tricyclic or an MAOI. These were drugs that were popular in like the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. We have newer, better medications now. And part of the reason why they're not so great is they have a lot of side effects, 
Any drug has a side effect. Every drug has a side effect. Even something as benign as caffeine, right, can make it where you're jittery or anxious or struggle to sleep, right? Every drug has a side effect to it. These older ones have quite a few. And part of the reason for that is they're very nonspecific in the way that they work. The newer ones are selective, selective serotonin, right? Serotonin, norepinephrine, right? They're very like more targeted. The old ones, the MAOIs or the MAUIs, as they're sometimes called, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, as it says up there, monoamine oxidase. They inhibit an enzyme that exists in our body called monoamine oxidase to thereby increase serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So they do one thing to affect three others. It's a very like um, global effect that these would have. And so they tended to lead to a lot of side effects. The most common example is a drug called Nardil, not even used anymore. It was popular in the 50s and 60s. The tricyclics, when they came out, were a little bit better. They cut a step. So they cut that MAO step and they just increased serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. But even those, that's three, right? And they don't tend to be as popular anymore. The most common one was Elevil, right? So I put a line here because these top two are almost never used. They were popular years ago. We have better ones now, um, so we don't use them anymore. The newer ones and the ones that are much more popular and common and that you probably see and hear commercials for, or maybe even know people who are taking, are the SSRIs and the SNRIs. SSRI stands for Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And it's selective, it only works on serotonin, right? And so oftentimes with this, these drugs, what they do is they specifically increase the amount of serotonin to help people feel better. These are drugs like Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro and others, but those are some of the big ones. And they tend to have less side effects because they're more selective. Similar, but a slightly different approach, SNRIs, so serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, work on serotonin and norepinephrine. These are drugs like Cymbalta, Effexor, Pristique, and others. And so the idea is depending on the symptoms that you have, when you go into either a doctor or a psychiatrist, they're gonna look at your symptoms and then they're gonna start a medication. So let's say you're really struggling with depression. They decide to put you on Zoloft, right? That we're going to try Zoloft. We'll see if it will work for you. If a person doesn't react well to the Zoloft, then maybe we try Prozac. And if they don't react to two drugs within a category, then maybe we move to a different category of drugs. Sadly, antidepressants are a lot of trial and error. And if you've ever known someone who has depression who takes medication, it's not common that you find the right drug the first time you try. It's very common that people will go into a doctor or psychiatrist, they'll be prescribed a medication, and then it takes weeks for that medication to work, like up to six to eight weeks for it to reach a full like dose where it's effective. And then oftentimes the side effects might be something that someone can't tolerate, right? It causes stomach issues or headaches or makes you feel like groggy a lot of the symptoms that you might be struggling with can be made worse by these antidepressants. And so it's a lot of trial and error to find one, find one that works. And it can take time, which is really frustrating. If you go in and you're like depressed and you need help and they're like, here's a medication, it'll take eight weeks before we know whether or not it works. And at that point, then it might take another two to go off of it. And then you'd have to try another one. It could take months to find the right one. But when you do find the right one, they can be incredibly helpful. Right. So again, a lot of a lot of trial and error. And each one of these has their own side effect profile, which sometimes people can tolerate or, or maybe not, depending. They mentioned serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is when you have too much serotonin, it can actually be fatal. Right. So these are things that need to be monitored by a doctor or psychiatrist um, because the side effects for them can be somewhat challenging. Has anyone known someone who's taken one, like gone through that process? Any like comments or stories about antidepressants? Yeah. So yeah. No. Yeah. And a lot of people with depression never take medication, right? Mm -hmm. It might be that you don't need it, that you can manage it on your own. Uh, a lot of people are what you would call like high functioning, have high functioning depression. So maybe you have all this stuff, but you don't require treatment. Uh, you just kind of soldier through. It can also be that someone takes a medication for a matter of months 
and it almost corrects the body's chemistry, and they can go off of it and be okay. Other people might take it for years or forever. So it's kind of like a huge range, right? Some people nothing, some people short term, some people. Yeah. People it could be right because if something's helping you and working, it'd be terrifying to like be like, okay, I'm gonna go off of it and see what happens. And sometimes when people go off of it, they in their mind they make themselves worse, right? And so that can only add to it too. But uh, it could be again that you take it forever, or it could be a short term thing, or maybe you go down and dose it over time and see if you can do what's called titrating off of it. That's a very common. Thank you. Do you know that if you are like this with your friends and you were having like a piece of like this about getting off of it, yeah, it helps save you and you just stop. Right. You can just say that to make everything work. Yeah. You feel like getting off and say that can help. Once you're off of it, it's like that. Mm -hmm. And normally they'll help guide you through that, right? So let's say, yeah, you've always been taking, you know, 50 milligrams a day has been your dose for years and then you go down to 25. Packs and then you go down to like 10 or every other day, right? And you kind of slowly, gradually get yourself off of it. And if everything comes back, then you might go up that down, right? And that happens sometimes too. Did you have a? Yeah, um, does your body have tolerance? It can over time, right? And so what can happen sometimes is they help for a while and then maybe you have to go up in dosage a little bit because your body is no longer responding. Or it could be that your body kind of adjusts and corrects itself and then you can go off of that. It's wild how our chemistry is so different. We have no way of testing for this. Like you can't go in and find out if your serotonin level is 65, right? Um, it's not like a blood test that you can take, but you can like try something that manipulates serotonin and see how you react. Uh, some people react in like the opposite way. I mean, we wouldn't know that until we simply try it. Even something like I mentioned is benign as caffeine. Like my partner and I have polar opposite reactions to caffeine and it's so mild, right? It's such a mild drug. But I can not have caffeine like after two o'clock and be able to sleep that night. My partner can literally drink coffee like in bed and fall asleep, right? Like everybody's different in the way that they react to substances, even something as benign as caffeine. Other like, questions or th uh, thoughts or comments or anything here? I guarantee you see... Uh, commercials for these all the time. I see commercials for these all the time on TV. It's kind of become like a weird hobby of mine to listen to the side effect profiles of, of drugs on uh, commercials. I don't know why I like I find it so disturbing. My partner and I always vote after each one. Would you rather have the disorder or deal with the side effects of the drug? Because some of them are really intense, right? It's intense. The side effects that these can uh, cause. Uh, I probably I don't think I have enough time. So I'll start with that next time. I have a I think it's a Cymbalta commercial to play for you. Again, a lot of these have side effect profiles that can make them hard to tolerate. So we'll, we'll pick up with that on uh, on Wednesday. And then don't forget uh, that extra credit opportunity if you want to do it now or later in the semester, um, as we talked about on, on Canvas. So uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. I'll see you all on Wednesday.